What's up everybody, Matt Moran here for another weekly update. So there's lots of news to go over here this week, but before I get into that, I do want to say this will be the last weekly update in this uh, office here. I will be uh, in a new office here next week, and uh, so yeah, this TV will be uh, going away, and uh, we'll be obviously restyling everything in here, and we'll be making some updates over the next few weeks. But yeah, last one here in this office, and so it's the end of an era. But anyway, uh, the first news story this week is some pretty big stuff. So this actually is something I haven't really seen elsewhere um, yet, and so I got a scoop from a fan this week, actually, and their intel comes from two separate insiders um, that are both claiming the same thing. Um, so, but these are still rumors, but it seems to be fairly credible to me. But anyway, they claim that Ford will de be debuting a four-door Mustang sedan in the 2022 calendar year. So this is something that'll be coming next year. Um, and they say styling wise, um, they are claiming it's gonna be something similar to how you would imagine, like what Aston Martin did with the Rapide, you know, when they went from a DB9 to a Rapide and kind of stretched it out. They're saying to kind of envision the same type of thing. So I'm guessing it'll look like the next generation Mustang, which is also supposed to come next year, but just with uh, two extra doors there in the back. Probably will still have the fastback roof line and stuff like Mustangs do. We'll have to wait and see on all that, but that's kind of what I'm envisioning, although I don't have any, you know, reference to go off of. But anyway, so that's, that's the looks. You know, we don't have any details really on that yet. But uh, they did give powertrain details, um, which will likely be shared with the two-door version, I'm guessing, if it sounds like they might be on the same platform and stuff, because this is an actual car. This isn't, you know, like the Mach-E or something like that. This is, you know, on a normal, you know, rear-wheel drive uh, sedan chassis. Um, and so anyway, here's what they're saying as far as powertrains go. Um, they say that the base engine is going to reportedly be the EcoBoost 2.3 combined with the F-150's PowerBoost hybrid tech, um, which will add weight for sure, but will give that uh, base engine you know, way more power than it had in the past. So that's cool. Um, the Coyote V8 will be offered along with a manual. So a four-door Mustang with a V8 and a manual, which sounds amazing. I know it didn't work for Chevy with the SS sedan, uh, but it has worked for Dodge, you know, at least with a V8 component. And if I were Dodge, I would be trying to figure out how to incorporate a manual in the next-gen Charger coming down the road if Ford will be offering one here in this four-door Mustang. But that alone is amazing. Just the fact Coyote V8's coming back and it's gonna have a manual in this sedan, that's gonna make it a really hot car for a lot of people, I think. The one interesting thing I'm still up in the air about, though, is with that hybrid component on that base motor, if that truly is the base setup, you know, I don't know if there's going to be a manual option for the EcoBoost anymore because I don't know if you can run a manual with that uh, hybrid setup. And so it might be that the V8 is the only one that has the manual option. We'll have to wait and see on all that. That was not in my Intel. That's just something I'm guessing here. But anyway, I also asked about a V6 option since, you know, the power boost is in the F-150 is paired up with the 3.5 liter uh, V6 uh, twin turbo. And um, so they said that actually um, the PowerBoost V6 will supposedly be the top engine option, at least in this sedan. Um, you know, so we'll have to see how all that plays out and stuff. It wouldn't be a stretch, obviously, because you have turbos on a V6 and an electric component. Then that could help to definitely give it way more power than what the Coyote can do, um, you know, without any uh, extra stress, I guess, on the V8 motor and stuff. So we'll have to see on all that, uh, but that's interesting. And you might be wondering, you know, well, Ford said they're not doing any more sedans. But what Ford said was that the only car they will continue to make is the Mustang. But, um, you know, as we've seen with the Mach-E and stuff, they can stretch the Mustang name. And so uh, the thinking here, and this is actually Ford Authority reported on this last year that Ford was basically saying that anything outside of a pickup truck uh, could be eligible for the Mustang branding. And so this kind of allows them to still be like, no, see, we're only making Mustangs for cars, um, which is technically true, but it will be a four-door sedan and will be able to offer, you know, Ford will be able to offer to their customers an actual four-door car for the ones who don't want to go into an SUV. Potentially, this could even be a police option, uh, you know, maybe if it's going to be something that can compete with the Charger, then, you know, maybe they can have an angle there as well for, you know, um, police departments that don't want all SUVs or something. Who knows? We'll have to see. Um, but, I mean, it sounds like great news to me. I mean, now that, you know, the Mach-E is a reality and we've all just grown to accept it, uh, I think this is a lot easier to handle, you know, an actual four-door Mustang. I think that could be awesome, especially with a V8 and a manual. Um, you know, that would be a, a very cool a car that even I would consider having someday. So that's, uh, that's awesome to hear that. And, uh, yeah, I guess we'll have to wait and see if this does in fact arrive next year. And if we start seeing prototypes and things like that, 
uh, running around, you know, that would be, uh, you know, our first indication that this is actually true and going to happen in the time frame that they mentioned. But if nothing else, uh, 2022 should be pretty interesting for Mustang fans if this comes and you also get the actual next-gen Mustang for the 2023 model year like it's been rumored. That could be pretty awesome stuff. So anyway, interesting to hear that. And um, for some official news this week, uh, there's several new cars that were revealed. And so the first one here is uh, Hyundai has revealed the 2022 Ionic 5. And so this is arriving in North America this fall. And even though it still looks like the concept car, this is the actual production version and it looks awesome. I love the retro futuristic look of this thing. It's super cool. It's kind of like the Honda E that Honda won't give us, except this thing's way faster and has way more range. So all of a sudden I'm not missing the Honda E, any, e anymore. This thing seems to be way cooler. But anyway, um, so it's the first vehicle on Hyundai's new eGMP electric platform. And even though it looks like a small hatchback, the wheelbase is actually longer than a Hyundai Palisade, their massive three-row crossover. And it's about two inches taller than a, even a Kona. So this thing's, you know, actually fairly large. I mean, lengthwise, it's about two inches shorter than an Elantra. So it's not super long. It's just that wheelbase is super stretched out there to the corners. Um, and the Ionic 5 is also going to be available with either rear-wheel drive or all-wheel drive. Um, the single motor rear wheel drive setup does 215 horsepower, 258 pound feet of torque, and the all wheel drive dual motor setup does 302 horsepower and 446 pound feet of torque. So that'll be the punchy one. Uh, and unlike some other electric cars, power numbers are the same regardless of which battery you choose. There's going to be two batteries available here. Uh, it's going to be a 58 kilowatt hour battery, and then exclusive to North America, we get a 77.4 kilowatt hour battery as well. That's about five. Uh, kilowatt hours larger than the largest option the rest of the world gets. The rest of the world gets like a 72 pack um, and so this one we get here is 77. Strangely though even with the extra weight of the bigger battery the bigger battery versions have faster 0 to 60 times. So I guess even though they're quoting the same horsepower, it must deploy the horsepower better in the bigger battery ones or something. Um, so on the rear-wheel drive version, 0 to 60 is 8.5 seconds with the small battery, 7.4 with the big one. And on the all-wheel drive version, the smaller battery does a 6.1 second 0 to 60, and the bigger battery does it in 5.2 seconds. So that would be the fastest one. 5.2 seconds 0 to 60 is very quick. Uh, so that's pretty awesome. You know, I know we're all used to Tesla acceleration times and stuff, but I mean, that is still a very respectable acceleration. We don't have any range given yet for any of these, uh, but the 64 kilowatt hour battery in the Kona Electric does 258 miles of range currently. So expect slightly less for the 58 kilowatt hour battery in the Ionic, and then slightly more for the 77.4 kilowatt hour battery. I'm guessing that one, you know, might be very high 200s or something, you know, probably just under 300. Um, and to help a little bit uh, with keeping the battery charged, there's even a solar roof that's available, just like you get on the Sonata Hybrid. So that's a very cool touch. Obviously it's not gonna charge very much, but you know, even if it gives you a tiny bit extra, uh, that would be awesome, especially if you live in a super sunny place. You park your car for the day, and you come back after a day of work sitting out in the sun, and now your electric car has a little bit more range to it. That would be a nice little thing. On the inside, it also has a somewhat retro and uh, design to it, but it is, of course, very futuristic as well. But I just love you have a slim dashboard with a totally open floor underneath the dash, just like you had on about all the old cars back in the day in you know, the 40s, 50s, 60s. Everything was just wide open under the you know dashboard there and uh this is awesome that it has that hyundai says that this openness actually even allows the driver to slide over to the passenger side to get out of the car if they want to because the center console actually slides back so this is like one step short of actually having a bench front seat which would be super cool if they actually had that uh, but i mean you can actually slide around like it is a bench seat basically because that slides back with that center console another cool touch is that there's leg rest that you can put up and recline when the car is parked which is pretty cool there's also uh, a magnetic panel that you can put things on with refrigerator magnets on the dashboard, which is uh, a pretty cool little touch. And it's uh, still pretty high tech though. I mean, you have 12 inch displays, both for the gauges and the infotainment. There's an available head up display that can do augmented reality navigation. And even though the hatch seems about as small as the Kona for the cargo space in the back there, the rear seats do slide uh, forwards and backwards to give you extra cargo space if needed. So you could potentially have more than the Kona, you know, which you know, doesn't have a sliding second row. So that's a nice little perk here. And there's no pricing yet for these, but uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to checking them out this fall. It seems very promising. And I just love that they stuck so close to the concept. Mercedes this week has revealed the 2022 C-Class, which is all new brand new generation C-Class. 
And the styling definitely looks similar to other new Mercedes sedans. And, you know, it's not super distinctive, but I think it's still really attractive. Uh, it's a little bit bigger as well. It's about a half an inch wider, two and a half inches longer, and it's on a one inch longer wheelbase now. And these larger dimensions do help out with the interior, which is a little more roomy than before. And it's packed with the newest technology, like an 11.9 inch infotainment screen with a vertical orientation there. Very similar to what you get on the new S-Class. And there's also a 12.3 inch uh, digital gauge cluster display there, which looks pretty cool. And uh, both of those are standard, by the way. No more making people pay to upgrade to bigger screens, supposedly, which is really great um, that, you know, you just get that stuff as standard. Um, and then uh, the fingerprint reader from the S-Class is also even available uh, to pull up all your personalized settings and stuff if you want. The rest of the interior also looks very impressive with these cool new vent designs and lots of carbon fiber trim on this because the way this interior is designed, those trim pieces are massive. Um, and so, yeah, th I believe this is an AMG line version here. So that's why you have all the carbon fiber on the inside. I'm guessing you can make that wood or piano black plastic in a base model or something like that. Um, but also a lot of other nice little touches. There's big, large metal speaker grills in the doors there and stuff. Pretty, uh, pretty up market. Engine-wise, though, the only one announced so far is the base engine, which is uh, the same two-liter turbo four-cylinder and nine-speed automatic combo from before, but it does do 22 more pound-feet of torque for power totals now of 255 horsepower and 295 pound-feet of torque now. And like I mentioned last week, all C-classes are hybrid now, um, but the base setup is just a 48-volt mount hybrid setup, which gives you extended stop starting um, and extended coasting, so it'll turn the engine off when you're going downhill hills and stuff like that. Um, but the electric motor can provide 20 horsepower and 148 pound feet of torque on its own as well. And so even with this help and extra torque though, the zero to 60 time is actually 0.2 seconds slower than the old C-Class doing a 5.9 seconds zero to 60 now. Um, it's still going to be available with either rear wheel drive or all wheel drive. But interestingly, even though it's a 2022 model year vehicle, it's not going to be available until early 2022. So we're still, you know, maybe about a year or so away from that. Uh, there's no price for those yet, but that'll come you know, closer to its on sale date. Land Rover this week has revealed the 2022 Defender, which isn't any different as far as its looks, but the huge addition here is that it's now available with a V8 engine. So uh, it also gets an improved infotainment system as well. But first, that V8, it's the supercharged five liter. Um, and in its application, it does 518 horsepower and 461 pound feet of torque. And this allows the Defender to get from zero to 60 in only 4.9 seconds now. And Land Rover's also fortified the rest of the Defender to handle that extra power with bigger brakes, bigger anti-roll bars, along with some changes to the rear diff, the adaptive suspension and uh, drive mode setups. And the drive mode uh, also now gets a dynamic mode in the Defender, which it didn't have before. The V8 is also available with both the two-door and four-door variants. So you can get it either way, uh, which is kind of cool because you know even like the V8 Wrangler, that's only a four-door thing. So the fact you can get it here in the two-door for the Defender is pretty sweet. And then as for the infotainment, that also gets some updated software and the option to upgrade to the larger 11.4 inch touchscreen now. You also get some V8 badges and things like that too. But anyway, there's no pricing for these yet uh, or an exact on sale date because Defenders have been kind of slow with coming to the States here, but they should be arriving before the end of this year, I'm guessing for the V8 versions. And so exciting to see that they've added that. The other awesome V8 powered off-roader here uh, did get a price this week and that is the 2021 Jeep Wrangler Rubicon 392. So the rumors on that were accurate. I talked about that a few weeks back. Um, the starting price will be $74,995. But that price is for a launch edition version, which basically comes fully loaded, but basically the only other options you can add on are the type of roof you want, which can add some extra money, and then uh, the different types of doors you can get, and that's it. Otherwise, it's basically fully loaded. And also, you have to keep in mind that these 392, um, they also beefed up a bunch of stuff for this version of the Wrangler. You know, it has an active exhaust as well to take advantage of that, you know, V8 sound. And it has, you know, all kinds of other things they beefed up to handle the extra power and weight. So, you know, it's not just like they dropped the V8 in and they're charging 20 grand more for the, uh, you know, edition of the V8. There's a lot of other stuff that goes into jacking that price up. And then again, a fully loaded Wrangler with all the equipment, you know, that's also going to contribute to a lot of that jump as well. So hopefully there will be a non-launch edition someday. And that one will hopefully be a lower price tag. But um, yeah, that's uh, pr pretty crazy. And if you're willing and able to pay that 75 grand for a Wrangler, these uh, launch editions will be arriving this spring. So cool to see that. 
And uh, something else that's uh, <laughs> pretty expensive, but even in a whole nother world, is that if you remember a few months back, the designer of the McLaren F1, uh, Gordon Murray, he revealed this awesome T50 supercar, which has this naturally aspirated V12, manual transmission, central seating position, a bunch of other cool stuff that's amazing, and um, like every car enthusiast uh, dream. And so um, he made a track only version that just came out this week uh, that honors Nicky Lauda called the T50 Nicky Lauda. And it's more more than just paint and special aerodynamics though he's managed to remove over 200 pounds from the already light car that now only weighs 1878 pounds i don't know if that's curb weight or dry weight but regardless it's really light um and to add to that insanity the 3.9 liter cosworth v12 is now straight piped and adds a roof scoop to allow it to do 66 more horsepower for a total of 725 horsepower in a car that weighs under 1900 pounds Pounds. Talk about absolutely bananas performance. That is just, oh man, that'd be bonkers to drive. Anyway, so since this version is more focused on lap times than the street version is, the manual transmission has been swapped for a six speed paddle shifted X track racing transmission instead. Totally understandable. I mean, but for that reason, I think I'd rather go for the street version because uh, then you can also drive it on more than just a racetrack. But anyway, uh, the interior is also pretty prepared for racing with a racing style steering wheel, different gauge setup, uh, and a removal. They removed one of the seats as well. So uh, it used to be a one plus two setup, and so now it's a one plus one, um, which is kind of interesting there. Uh, so, but that's uh, pretty wild. And uh, only 25 of these are going to be made starting in January of 2022, and they'll be. 4.3 million dollars each and uh, 15 of the 25 are already sold so a lot of people already think that that's well worth it and if i had uh, you know tons and tons of money i would probably be in line for one of these as well because that is just sounds so epic and so amazing and uh, yeah awesome to see that the 2022 Lexus NX was just leaked this week online uh, thanks to a video that Club Lexus spotted before it was removed. I guess it was quickly uploaded and then taken down. Uh, but as you can see, it has lots of nice changes here. I especially like you know, this new full width LED strip in the back there. It looks really cool. And overall, it looks like a cross between the new IS and a smaller RX kind of. Inside, it gets a big change where it looks like Lexus is finally ditching the touchpad completely and going to a big touchscreen. Uh, the new shifter and steering wheel look really cool as well and looks to get uh, larger digital gauges as well but yeah since this was just a quick leak and that's it uh, there's no powertrain details yet but uh you know it has been in the past we've been rumors that were circulating that it was going to you know since it uses the same platform as the RAV4 there could be a RAV4 Prime powertrain that's available here in the NX that would be really cool if you can you know have some type of plug-in hybrid here but if nothing else we'll have a regular hybrid and a regular gas version most likely still um, for that although they might follow the Venza and go exclusively hybrid for these too we'll have to wait and see on all that um, but anyway um, yeah not sure when we'll get the official reveal for that since this again was just an unofficial leak but hopefully we get to see you know all of the new NX soon so cool to see that Kia this week has revealed the 2022 Carnival, which replaces the Sedona as their minivan, even though Kia insists on calling it a multi-purpose vehicle and refuses to call it a minivan. Uh, it's kind of funny. Uh, but anyway, it looks the same as the Korean version that was revealed last year, other than the addition of orange side markers and black wheels on this trim. So nothing to really talk about with the looks here, but I think it looks great. It looks like a Land Rover minivan, honestly. It looks really cool. Um, it's the first Kia to also get their new logo as well. And so that's an interesting little change there. But mechanically, it's going to be on the same new platform as the Sorento. But unfortunately, it doesn't get that vehicle's turbo engine. So instead, power still comes from the old 3.5 liter V6 that does 290 horsepower, 262 pound-feet of torque. Um, and that is just barely best in class for the horsepower, beating the Pacifica by three. Um, but it runs through an 8-speed automatic to the front wheels only. There's no all-wheel drive available. So... You have to go for the Sienna or the Pacifico if you want all-wheel drive. Inside, it is very nice and similar to other modern Kias with the 12.3 inch digital gauges and touchscreen being optional with an eight inch touchscreen and analog gauges as the standard setup there. Uh, it can be had with uh, either a bench or uh, captain's chairs for the second row. Uh, and then the VIP seating package will be available in America here and offers full power second row seats with both heating and cooling along with leg rests and the ability for the whole seat 
to tilt backwards, even when upping the Sienna's reclining seats, which merely just uh, have the leg rest and that's it. Um, so that's pretty cool. And the standard bench can also be removed if you want maximum cargo space. And the third row does fold into the floor as well. And uh, so yeah, seems to be a good amount of space. I think they said it's a tiny bit uh, smaller than some of the other minivans by an inch or so. It's you know very minor stuff, but probably won't be the biggest. But uh, you know certainly will be you know a very cool setup here. And I think the looks will help sell it a lot because I, I think those looks are very distinctive. And anyway, it's going to be on sale this spring. So cool to see that. And just last week, you know, Mitsubishi revealed their all-new Outlander, and I covered that in great length last week. But the uh, PHEV version, the plug-in hybrid, they said would be coming later. They didn't get any specific about that, you know. But then this week, they did come out with specifics, um, but they're saying it's just going to be an, out, an updated version of the old Outlander uh, PHEV. And uh, I guess that's going to be sticking around for a while longer here because um, the changes here... Are pretty substantial but again it's on the old body and stuff so i um, not sure why they're doing all this for an old platform but regardless here's the changes they're swapping engines for one they're going to a new 2.4 liter four-cylinder engine that which replaces the two liter that was in the regular plug-in hybrid before and then there's a new electric motor in the rear that adds 10 extra kilowatts of power for a total of 221 horsepower total now um, which is 31 more horsepower than before so pretty meaningful upgrade there. The battery is also bigger, going from a 12 kilowatt hour battery to a 13.8 kilowatt hour battery, which provides two extra miles of range, now at 24 miles of range total. And that extra battery pack allows you to get more of the federal tax credit as well. Um, so that bumps that up so that you can actually kind of lower the price of the 2021 Outlander here with that. And um, the pricing is actually the same as last year too. So potentially with that extra tax credit, you, these will come in under um, you know, sticker price, you know, what you're going to be getting on a 2020 Outlander plug-in hybrid. But of course, they're all going to be pretty, you know, reasonably discounted and stuff as well. But if you can get a 2021 here, you get those nice little extra improvements for technically no extra money uh, as far as MSRPs go. Uh, but I still feel like most people would rather just wait for the all-new Outlander because now you've shown everyone, here's what the awesome new Outlander is going to look like. It's really cool. By the way, here's, if you want to plug in hybrid, you're in the penalty box, you get the old car still that's, you know, inferior in all the other ways aside from fuel economy. And um, so, yeah, kind of weird play there by Mitsubishi to do that. But um, hopefully there is, you know, a new plug in hybrid on the all new Outlander maybe next year. And, you know, this is just kind of a band aid to get them by until, you know, next year comes. We'll have to wait and see. But interesting nonetheless. Um, Rolls Royce this week has some interesting news too. So they revealed the Phantom Tempest collection. So it's inspired by space and has some cool touches here, um, like a unique starlight uh, headliner with an image of a pulsar in it. And so that's pretty wild. Uh, the door panels also get that uh, starlight illumination and the dashboard is a single piece of aluminum with 100 individual columns milled into it for a trippy design that they call frozen flow of time. And to further drive home this disregard for time, they deliberately removed the clock from the dashboard and included a quote from Einstein in the glove box as he's quoted as saying, the distinction between past, present, and future is only a stubbornly persistent illusion, which seems strange because I feel like the people that are rich enough to afford a Phantom and the limited edition Phantom at that uh, generally, you know, do value their time. Um, that is one thing that wealthy people do value very highly. I mean, we all should value our time, but especially time is money uh, for a lot of these people. And so the fact that the Rolls Royce thinks that good marketing angle is to disregard the value of time just seems kind of uh, like you're barking up the wrong tree with this uh, whole idea. But anyway, um, it seems like they're right on the money because only 20 of these things are going to be built and they're all sold out already. So who am I to uh, judge? You know, clearly they at least were able to sell 20 of them, even if they're just for collectors or something. But anyway, uh, other cu a couple little odds and ends they've changed about it. So it gets a custom champagne chest um, with another hand painted pulsar on it. And the champagne chest comes stocked with uh, all kinds of caviar spoons and all kinds of other rich <laughs> rich people stuff. Uh, otherwise, uh, it gets an exclusive Kairos blue color, which is a very cool color there for the exterior. Mechanically, it's the same, of course. No one cares about that in a Rolls Royce. You know, it's uh, all, all just the same. Um, but it's a cool little special edition, and uh, there's no pricing for them. But of course, it doesn't matter because, like I said, they're all sold out. So it's irrelevant. 
Tesla this week has uh, strangely discontinued the standard range version of the Model Y and this version just started being available in January and then got a $2,000 price cut last week and now the only way to get one is to order it over the phone or in a Tesla showroom. You cannot get it online and usually when they do the order over the phone thing it means it's most likely on its way out. Maybe they're clearing out just the last few models that are sitting around or something and that's it. Um, and when um, they were asked as to why it's gone so fast, Elon Musk tweeted that he didn't think the range meets Tesla's standard of excellence, um, meaning having less than 250 miles of range, I guess, is their standard of excellence. Um, and uh, I just think, okay, so sure, if that's your standard of excellence, great, but then why did you offer it in the first place? Was your standard of excellence... 240 miles, uh, you know, two months ago, and now it's like, oh, it has to be 250 or more. So I, I don't know, it just seems kind of kind of an odd thing. If you're just, I mean, usually Elon Musk is pretty blunt. He should just be like, yeah, like they're not selling great, or we just decided we didn't want to do it anymore, whatever. But um, they're kind of doing this whole like PR spin on it, which is kind of bizarre. But anyway, um, to compensate for the fact that now the uh, cheapest Model Y is like 49 grand, um, they did say they're going to be rolling out a single motor Y with the long range battery in a few months, which will improve affordability. And with that um, less power draw, I'm guessing that one will also do much higher range and maybe be the new uh, champion for the Model Y as far as the maximum amount of range you can get out of one. Um, but they also say that'll improve the affordability um, and you know make sure that you have that standard of excellence that's uh, maintained of over 250 miles of range. Um, so interesting there. And uh, yeah, I guess if you want something a little bit more affordable, you're gonna have to go for like a base Mustang Mach-E or something like that. And there's two last little miscellaneous stories that are really interesting and I thought were worth talking about. So first, the US Postal Service this week finally revealed their new mail truck um, after years of shopping around for a new truck. I think they started this whole process back in 2015 and now here we are six years later and they finally decided on what they're gonna do for the new mail trucks. There's many companies that were fighting for this 10 year government contract to build mail trucks. They're gonna do over 100,000 of these things they're gonna build. Um, and the winner was Oshkosh and their NGDV. Um, which is the result of a partnership with Ford actually. So it's partially based on a transit van. Um, and so uh, these vehicles will begin service in late 2023 with some being gas powered and others being electric. They'll be thoroughly modern as well and actually have heat and air conditioning, which sadly these van, these mail trucks did not have before. Postal workers will finally be able to have the luxuries that any other person that's bought a vehicle in the past 45 years has had. So that'll be nice. And uh, it has also all the newest safety tech and stuff as well, like air bags, which is also a new feature that these uh, mail trucks haven't had before. Um, crazy stuff. But anyways, that'll be a nice improvement. It's unfortunate they have to wait until late 2023 to get those improvements. Um, so hopefully they can uh, make it through the next uh, you know, two and a half years here uh, with those old trucks. But anyway, interesting to see that. Um, and lastly, there's some hope for um, and good news for all of you and myself that love gas powered vehicles, or if you're not a fan of um, you know, the electric vehicle plans that these car companies are putting out and uh, you know, all the stuff the governments are announcing um, with phasing out you know, gas cars and stuff. Um, so Porsche this week has announced an update on their synthetic e-fuels um, that they're developing. And so other companies have been developing this kind of stuff as well, um, but Porsche seems to be a little bit further along than the others with their development. So uh, this is pretty exciting. So the fuel is made from CO2 and hydrogen using renewable energy um, as far as how it's actually produced. And um, it's burned in existing engines without needing any changes or adjustments. You can literally pour it into any current engine and it works, which is kind of mind blowing as well. Uh, but Porsche claims it makes an engine as clean as an electric vehicle. And they told Evo Magazine they expect 85% reduction in CO2, which they say puts it on the same level as the amount of CO2 produced uh, to manufacture and charge an electric car over its lifetime. So Porsche could have potentially kind of made the electric car irrelevant if they can deliver on these claims and if the fuel is actually affordable, as cheap as gas. I mean, there's a lot of other, you know, if then, you know, kind of things before this actually would, um, you know, do that. But 
Anyway, so they'll begin testing it here in their new GT3 race cars in 2022 with the first batch only being around 34,000 gallons. So, I mean, I'm sure that, you know, just in the time that I've been doing this weekly update, there's been 34,000 gallons of gasoline probably pumped all around the country here. So, um, you know, it's definitely a very small batch. We're still in the very early stages of this, um, and I'm not sure how expensive it would be. I think I saw somewhere people were saying that in Europe there's a little more promise, and maybe some of my European fans can comment on this in Europe, you know, since gasoline is so much more expensive, it's only about twice as expensive as gasoline is in Europe, supposedly according to what I read, um, which would make it obviously twice as expensive to fill up, but it's not outrageous if your other alternative is to buy an expensive electric car or you can keep your current car, reduce those emissions immediately. Um, you know, that could kind of maybe be the better way to go. Uh, even if it had to be subsidized fuel um, to get those emissions dropped really quickly, I think that could even make some sense. But anyway, um, sticking to my notes here, other things is that, you know, we also don't know how it's going to scale up production wise, even if it was as cheap as regular gas, can they produce the massive amount of gas that's needed every day around the world? You know, that is, I think that's why this is still kind of far off. And I think that's why electric cars will still be a port, an important component of bringing down those CO2 emissions. But this could potentially be another thing in play that maybe by the 2030s, if this stuff really takes off, it can kind of phase out gasoline maybe and be a nice alternative there. We'll have to see on all that. Um, but I think the really cool thing here is that you know, we know that electric vehicles are coming. These companies have invested billions of dollars to make it happen. That's not just going to go away overnight, even if there is some new miracle fuel that is perfect in every way. Um, you know, electric cars will still come. I just hope that, you know, maybe with this kind of stuff, that electric cars will be a choice. You know, if it makes a lot of sense for a lot of people to have an electric car. And if that does fit your lifestyle or what you're looking for, I think that it's great to have electric cars as a choice. Um, and, you know, if... There is no CO2 downside to having these, you know, engine powered vehicles that have this cleaner burning stuff that is the equivalent of EV as far as emissions goes. Um, that's amazing. So Porsche could single-handedly have saved the internal combustion engine while also reducing CO2 emissions much faster um, to therefore, uh, you know, it's instead of everyone waiting to buy electric cars and, you know, GM forcing everyone to buy electric stuff in 2035 and stuff, we could, you know, potentially, if they scale this stuff up fast enough and it's cheap enough, we could drop those emissions immediately, um, which could really help the planet as well. So uh, overall, I mean, this is like a Grand Slam home run, 100%. Like, I hope they can make it cheap and make a ton of it. And um, we could, you know, maybe have some some good sounding engines still, uh, you know, way off in the future. And we don't have to sacrifice all that fun that we love. And we can still, you know, uh, help out the planet and stuff. So very interesting technology there. Um, man, I'm telling you what, if Porsche has cracked the code here with this, that is going to be amazing, amazing. I was really excited to hear about that. But yeah, so we'll see how that develops. Like I said, lots of hurdles to go across and you know, hurdle over before we actually get to that point. But anyway, that's it for all the news this week, guys. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed this weekly update. Thank you guys very much for watching. Please continue to stay safe and healthy. Let me know what you think about all this stuff in the comments below. And I'll see you guys on the next one. Take care.